Hello, hello. Hey, you're on mute. Uh, hi. Hey, hello. how's it going? Going good. Just the day has just started. Nice. Yeah. It's a good good way to start your day with the team pulmonary fibrosis. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true. Awesome. Uh, we're super excited for uh, you joining the, the team and in whatever capacity that you can help us define um, the, the medical uh, problem statement, it would be amazing just because primarily the team consists of data scientists. And even though we have, uh, you know, bi biomedical researchers from like Nebraska Medical Center and others, um, more, more heads, more brains is always better. So yeah. welcome, uh, first of all, and maybe you can uh, give us like a quick, like two sentence introduction of, of uh, who you are and how you think you can help. Uh, so yeah, so currently I am a student at the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. I'm in my second year and I'm pursuing my uh, master's in applied data science. I'll be graduating in May 2021. So before coming to USC, I worked as an associate data scientist back home for around two years at a startup. So I got to like work on different use cases and machine learning and computer vision and different projects, which were like really, it was really cool. So which got my interest in pursuing my master's in data science. So coming after coming here, similarly, not just, I didn't just stick to the academic um what what a syllabus but also worked on different side projects in college and also in summer i uh, did um work as a student researcher as a, as well as a data scientist in a company just just for the sake of experience so yeah i'm pretty motivated to work for um on this particular problem statement of pulmonary fibrosis i never worked on a medical um uh, uh, or any medical use case before. And I think it is catching a lot of, it's going to gain a lot of scope ahead. So that's what caught my, and caught my eye of working on this project. And I thought that I won't be able to do it alone. So joining a team would be a better option so that I get to learn more and in depth. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that's you, started by, uh, you started by looking at the Kaggle challenge. Yes, I looked at the Kaggle challenge. I downloaded the data. I was exploring it. I was looking at what is the PyDCOM, what are like um, what are those images, CT scans, what all information we get. So I kind of did some basic exploratory analysis, but then I was like, what how, what is the target variable? What what do, how do we achieve what we have to achieve? So I was kind of stuck over there. And then I was like looking mm -hmm. at discussions and notebooks. And then I came across Corona Y that there is a team which is working on this particular project with some domain expertise um, on, um, uh, yeah, so what uh, this disease is about. And maybe so, yeah. And I also saw, I think, saw, um, I don't know, one sheet which said what all uh, meetings I'll have done and uh, what all, uh, what kind of people are involved, like from different varied backgrounds. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to work on with. Okay, oh. and uh, uh, we are approaching this challenge from a little bit different angle. So basically, what we want to do here at Corona Y is. Uh, build pretty strong general uh, computer vision long related model and then as a validation we want to give it a try on this challenge uh do you have familiarity with uh semi-supervised learning uh idea yeah it's very popular it's used a lot in in neural language processing like something like gpt or bird this the whole idea is training on the huge data sets without labels, or actually it's, it's always training with labels, but the idea is labels generated on, on the fly, it's, this is, these are auxiliary labels. For example, in computer vision, there are some, some tech many techniques, but some of them is like you take the image, you split it in, for example, two pieces. One goes from top, another from bottom, and you train the model to predict if it's taken from top or bottom. So this is something that is, does not require human labor, doesn't require doesn't cost okay. money, right? You, you generate it on the fly. There are many techniques used to, so basically you train a big 
and have a model on the big amount of data that doesn't have any meaningful labels. All the labels are generated on the fly. And then you take a really, really small amount of label data and you train the model and it achieves even better if you had uh, 10 times more labels or stuff like this. So this is what's called semi-supervised learning. And the idea that we want to try here is to train a model in a semi-supervised way, like the Google did for, I believe, ImageNet, Cifar. They, they, they trained this model. It's called CMCLR. And uh, they, okay. they trained it in a semi-supervised way. Mm -hmm. And it, it performed really well. Like they fine-tuned it on like 10% of labels of uh, a lot of benchmarks. They took multiple benchmarks and then they uh, took 10% of data or even less. And that would perform uh, like and achieve higher scores in state of the art, art of, at that time. So what we want to do is uh, take a lot of data sets. Those are models like general computer vision models mm. with, uh, to classify cats and dogs, you know, and planes and cars. So what we want to do is do something similar, but for uh, CT scans and okay. to be specific, long CT scans, uh, take few huge data sets, which we already found, train this model, uh, publish, like publish everything publicly, the scripts for training the data, model weights and stuff like this. And when we have this, pre-trained model, we fine tune it on this Kaggle data set and see if it helps, if it improves the score. So okay. basically on one point of view, on like one area or one task is training this uh, unsupervised model or semi-supervised model. Another area or parallel task is how do we use this as a starting point, this model, and uh, and use it in the Kaggle challenge to uh, to train the computer vision model starting from this point, like uh, transfer learning. Okay, yeah. One very important thing that uh, will will ease, like will simplify the training of semi supervised model, but will complicate things for Kaggle challenge probably, is that we are training the two-dimensional model and data we are working with are three-dimensional, meaning if, uh, yeah, so basically we'll probably need to resample or think uh, how, how do we achieve the same structure because if we have very good, uh, two-dimensional model that will generate, let's say, embedding, one vector, vector of, let's say, 200 values. And then we train this model, it's really good, it can be plugged in and use this semi surprise model. So now we want to plug it into Kaggle Challenge. And in Kaggle Challenge, we take one sample, it has 300 slices. It means 300 levels, right, of this DCOM image. And another has uh, 250, and another ha has 400. So the question is, how do, will we go about it? There, is, there are solutions, of course, we can uh, resample the same way as we resize images. We can resize 3D image same way. So we'll have to think, or we generate embedding for each slice and runs through LSTM or something like this. So we'll have to think about it, uh, will be a challenge to solve. But this is something that we'll need to think about after we train the semi-supervised model. Okay. And here we also have questions. We have challenges, for example, what uh, augmentation techniques to use. This SimCLR by Google that I mentioned, the idea mm -hmm. is they would take a picture and they will they would train the same is or similar same is network where you have triplets. So you take one image, do some augmentations and train the model to say that this first image and say and augmented image are the same images. And then you take random images again, apply, apply augmentations and train model to, to differentiate them. So basically if model, in order for model to, to solve this task, it has really to memorize the whole content of the picture, to encode the whole content of the picture, something like this. So basically if you're interested to start, for the first thing to start would be SimCLR model. Check okay. how guys in Google train this uh, computer vision model on okay. in semi-supervised way. And I think they have released the code. I think since this is a popular subject, probably probably uh, even have the PyTorch implementation available for the whole pipeline. And it's fine, we will take this, but we'll uh, apply it like uh, modify this for our needs. Okay. So what are, uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah, just wanted to say that probably is the very first thing, first link for you to go and check is uh, our document on Notion. 
Mm -hmm. uh, let me check if we have this. Pinned yeah, it's pinned message. So if you go to Slack in, into this channel, there is exactly one pinned item. Do you know how to access pinned item? Yeah, uh, which which channel is the the primary one? Yeah, let me uh, actually you can see the. I just resend the the message. Uh, yeah, yeah, I but think in I got general, it. If, okay. So there is Notion, right? Notion document. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I'd seen this before. Yeah. Uh, so you, can you see on this document data sets, models, semi-supervised learning? Yes, yes. Okay, so you would basically start with models. You can check data sets to see uh, what data sets we will use. Mm -hmm. And then okay. you will see models those are models that are used for uh, city data. So okay. basically we will look at these models and we will uh, use very similar architecture. Then we will look at CML, CM, CLR paper and we will have similar training uh, approach. So there we will take training approach from there. And after that we'll go to Kaggle and try to solve it with pre-trained model. So that's uh, the general idea. Maybe you have questions. Uh, yeah, so what is 3D data? I mean, uh, image story. So what does it, what is meant by 3D data? I mean, how do we have 3D data here? Uh, yeah, we have decom image, which is 3D data, which is 3D data, meaning, meaning it's, like in, it's like an image. It's just not a matrix. It's a cube. It's a three-dimensional array. And you can slice this array and get, get an image. So while, while training our first semi-supervised model, we will be taking these slices separately. Each slice will be taken separately as a picture, and this is going to be used to train a, a semi-supervised model. But our actual data in the in the challenge, like in our our pre-training data sets, they also three D, but we have no problems cutting them into photos, into two two D model uh, images. But our our data in Kaggle is three D, meaning when the person went to CT, they scanned the whole vo volume, you know? And then there are different devices, they scan with different, um, I'm not sure it's called precision or something like, they can make, take a scan every one millimeter of your body, or it, they can go every half a millimeter or every two millimeters, stuff like this. Okay, okay. And like what, uh, do we have to learn any new uh, tools or like which tools to have to learn. So like TensorFlow, I'm familiar. So which um, tools do I have to like just... Uh, we thought about using FastAI because specifically okay. they have some uh, libraries for and, and functions for medical imaging, which is, for example, for normalization. And probably we'll go with PyTorch because uh, everyone likes PyTorch and this is like... A, more convenient way probably to train. But anyway, I think the best way to learn is to learning on the fly, go learning on the go. And mm -hmm. for dealing with DCOMs, I used to work with simple uh, ETK. It's called simple, yeah, it's called simple ETK. Uh, but there are also some methods implemented in fast AI. So we'll probably use some of them as well. So, like the data is stored in house field units, this DCOM. And this units is basically intensity of the or density of the tissue at this point of, of volume of body. So the bone will have one intensity, the uh, parenthema of lungs will have different uh, density or like brain and bones, all stuff, muscles, they all have different uh, density. And so in the pictures you have different intensity, but uh, there is some such thing as CT window uh, what it means, like if we have this house field units, the value go, let's say, from 100 to 2000, yes, right? Then the simplest and the most stupid way is you just scale this from 0 to 125, right? And like mm -hmm. grayscale and print it. Yeah. But the problem is all the stuff that is actually important for radiologists, let's say it's, it's, it's hidden in between uh, 1000 and 1300. So if you scale the whole range, uh, you will basically, uh, your values of the image will go from zero to 255, but all the important stuff will be somewhere behind 
230 and 235 or something like this. So mm. on the image, it will all just be gray area that mm. will complicate things. So what usually people, the radiologists do, they apply this thing called CT window. It will like cut the scale, like it will remove everything that is below, let's say 230 and put this as a new zero and then stretch the rest of the histogram, the rest of the range. So you will, you will have very good and uh, picture of parenthema of flanks, but you will not be able to see bones or differentiate the bones because the, the whole is stripped, you know, something like this. And they, they have different windows for, uh, for bones, for lungs, uh, I mean radiologists. But for computer vision, even if these values are hidden somewhere like from uh, 1,300 to 1,350 and some values like uh, uh, the value from one pixel dif different from one pixel by some uh, decimals or hundreds of the of the number it's still fine with computer vision algorithms it's not a big deal so that's uh, I, I share this article article in uh, in our chats saying, don't look like radiologists, meaning mm. computer vision mm, algorithms, they don't have to, they don't need to strip the, the range. Still, it's a good idea to, norm, to normalize the histogram. So basically, if you have mm. a lot of values going from zero to 10, and then almost no values all the way to 100, and then some values from 100 to 50, 150, it means it's a good idea to stretch the range uh, and uh, like make the values going from zero to five take all the way from zero to 500. And maybe those values going from 100 to 50 take all the way from 50 to 150, you see? So mm. that's something called histogram normalization, I believe, or something like this. And in this article, you will see how, how it looks. And after applying it, uh, the model will probably learn better. So that's some uh, technical details. Why, why I'm saying this is, is because we will need this raw data with DCOM, big DCOM data and house field units. But the problem is some data sets, for example, one like the biggest uh, city related data set, actually pneumonia related data set I found is from some Chinese guy. And this, this data set is PNG and this PNG, PNG is generated after the lung window has been applied. So mm. after they stripped the values from and uh, from this range. So probably we'll not use this data set. We will have to check other data sets. When we have the raw decom, we'll do this histogram normalization and we will train this um, semi-supervised model. Once we can see that it's actually learning and it works, as the validation of this model, we will train it, or we will use it to fine tune and Kaggle data of this chances challenge and see if it helps. And if it helps, we'll publish the code and for, for this model, for Kaggle competition, as well as code for training semi-supervised models, a trained model, and we'll try to help the world by, by giving an example uh, of, of this approach. Because this yeah. is something that is, is just like, some, some people just wonder why this is, not done yet. Why there are papers like there are so many pre-trained models on ImageNet and uh, CIFAR and all those uh, on mm. those image benchmarks and datasets, but there are no uh, models pre-trained on lung, right? Yeah, on lung scans or something. I haven't. Uh, yeah, this is like the first time I'm dealing with a medical dataset in general. So I like I'm still exploring about it. So yeah, I've also haven't heard about. Any, I, I was going through papers as well, like CT scan, like images uh, where the data set is the CT scan of, I don't know. If, uh, so yeah, this was kind of new to me as well. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, when you have time, please check the document, check the SimCLR and uh, what that guy from FastAI, it's actually author of FastAI, put about viewing the Decom data. I will be back. I have to go, unfortunately, but I will be back here like in an hour or two, and then I will be available for a couple of hours probably to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Okay. So.
Awesome. I feel like we've accomplished a lot just by going through all the, the things. And this call will be also helpful for any other people that are still exploring how to help. Um, thanks a lot, guys. I'll, I'll upload the recording Stuart. shortly. Ah, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask. Uh, so you will share it in the chat channel? Please share, share it in the Slack channel. Yep, I'll do that uh -huh. in, in okay, a cool. couple of minutes. Okay. Okay, cool. Sounds it good. Was, Thank you, Kyrie. It was nice talking to you guys. Yeah, it was nice talking to you too. And uh, let me know, like, if I will be back. I have to go now, but uh, well, once I'm back, I'll answer any questions you might have. Oh. Awesome. All right. Thank okay. You guys. Bye, bye bye. Okay, thank you.